God, Boo, what the hell happened? You're being just please just go. What happened? Can, I just, can we just go? Just, I just need a fucking minute <laughs> and a shower. Maybe something really bad happened. Those kill you. I'll take my chances. Keeps me from doing worse things. Seven years without drinking. Hey, keep coming back, because it works if you work it. You're crazy. I know I'm crazy. You sure you're going to be OK? I'm not going to let this get the better of me. You look like a woman that likes to party. It's just a sip. It's not going to bite you. Whatever it is, we're going to throw it together. I cannot let him see that side of me. It ain't pretty. Hey everybody, it's Sean Christian giving you a little, yes, peekaboo with the cast and the creatives of the award-winning independent short, Boo, directed, written by, and starring Rakefit. Let's just start with you, Rakefit. Okay. Come on, you're wearing multiple hats, you're triple threat now. What was this? Well, first of all, why? Why, why did you put out Boo? Very good question. Um, well, because Jackson Love, my first film that I did not direct, but I wrote and produced and starred in, did pretty well on the on the fest circuit, and I made a lot of friends and contacts in the industry, in the indie film, especially indie horror industry. And so I was like, I want to make something else. I just got the itch to do something else, and I started. I wrote Boo. It took me a few months. I know Ned gave me feedback on it a lot. Um, Ned's been on this from like the get go. And, um, and, and I wanted to do something that was a little more horror because Jax is very thriller, kind of thriller based more than horror, in my opinion at least. Um, yep. So I wanted to do something a little bit more horror. And here we Which are. Which is a little out of your wheelhouse. I'm going to say we did a, a lot out book. of my wheelhouse. <laughs> Addicts Anonymous, we did your hysterical. And I remember we were talking about it and I just said, okay, why do you want to do this? It's completely out of your comfort zone, which is incredible. Kudos to you for doing that, by the way. Thank you. you know, I mean, I just, I now I would love to do comedy again because it's been a while, but I was getting really sick of it. And so I was like, I need to show people that I can act a little bit more and, <laughs> and that I can do other things. So here we and are. And you did. What are you most proud of with the, with the acting, directing, or the writing? I think the writing, actually. I think I'm more proud of the script than I am of my performance or my direction, necessarily. Like, um, uh, which is weird, because my writing is the thing that I have the least confidence in. But, um, but I don't know. I'm proud of the whole thing. I'm really proud of the whole thing. It came together really well, and these guys being in it like brought it to another level and Ned being on set with me and helping me brought it to another, and Alex's eyes and brain and just calm, cool collectiveness brought it to another level, so. Well, why don't we do that a second because you're, you're mentioning all these wonderful names of the people who've really come together to help make this thing a reality. So can we just give a little hello, introduction, a little bit about what they do, who they do. So when we reference them, um, we'll go, oh, there's Josh, there's Ned. Yeah, there's so they're not just they like, do. Yeah, heads. Yeah, um, let's Josh, you available? Can we chat with Josh? Sure. So go uh, ahead, man, lay it out. What I, are you doing for him? And, and uh, welcome, by the way. I play uh, Rakafet's uh, boyfriend in, in the movie. And yes. Abu. Yes, he's what my boo, and he's very understanding. <laughs> well, let me ask you, Josh, because you've done you know major films, big productions. And for those who are in the indie world, it's a different, different animal, not an easy mm -hmm. animal. Um, how do you, how were you able to make that adjustment? And do you have a preference? Um, I, I like, I, I like to do both. Uh, I think it's, I think you learn, a, you can learn a lot more on a smaller film because uh, one, I think the acting is, it's not that there's less pressure, but it's more, more you work together more uh and 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 there aren't as many uh you know there aren't as many restraints uh but i mean a big budget movie is fun and they yeah. tend to pay a little more than this one did for sure yeah no the paychecks are better that's for sure 
Everything. But I love, I love, I love working with, I, and I like, I like what you get, you get more hands on with this. You know, Ned was, we got, I, I learned from him. I learned from Rockefeller, uh, and uh, it was a lot of fun. I loved it. And, and also, it. Josh, I want to say, saved us with a big continuity thing. And I will never, ever forget it because there's a part in the car where my hood was up and then it was down and we shot it out of sequence. And he was like, isn't your hood down now or something? And I was like, oh my God, it really is. And have we had we shot that whole thing, we would have lost. I don't know. It just, everybody was doing 17 jobs. So yeah. it's like and impossible to, to know, but Josh was like there. That's like, what I love about it. Cause you're not stepping on like a script supervisor's shoes when, when you say that on what a- What script supervisor? <laughs> well, I know it's, it's more fun. Like we had a script supervisor. Which is great. You nailed something right on the head. And I think relative to big budgets, I think when you get into independence, you have a voice. You're more willing if you, you know, my experience, you're more willing to be creative and go, yeah, I can trip up here. There's not like 20 network executives or studio heads behind me. And we're all in this together. We have no time to do this scene. Yeah. Um, I think does that part just thrill you more than, is that what you enjoy most about making an independent? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, when, when I was a kid, I used to make little short movies with friends and that's part of what made me want to get in, into this industry. And so this feels more why I got into it and it feels more creative and it, you feel more like a troop than yeah. on, on a big production. Agreed, man, right, spot on. All right, so I'm gonna brought Ned, I'm gonna come back to everybody, by the way. Ned, you, you mentioned Ned, Ned, say hello. And uh, your contribution to the film, which is again, multiple hats. <laughs> Hello. Um, yeah, I uh, I edited the film, and uh, <clears throat> I think I, I, and I I, I think I provided a lot of free therapy um, to. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> there was a lot of crying and hugging. Ned was holding me a lot. <laughs> and uh, and I also um, because as you say, multiple hats. Uh, Rick Heffitt is um, uh, writing and producing and starring and directing and pretty much running the whole show. Uh, so because she's in every shot, pretty much, uh, I was on set basically kind of uh, executing the vision uh, in the sense that I was um, being her sort of uh, hands directorially to say like, okay, let's get it, let's get it done and let's make sure that, it, that Rick Everett approves all this. And then, you know, I got to call action, which is always fun. Um, and uh, and just essentially just giving a second pair of eyes on everything um, as we went because we just we had a lot to get through in three uh, nights that that seemed sh seemed both long and short at the same time. Yeah. So um, yeah, yeah. Question for you on that though, which is interesting. Yeah. You certainly as and to all the editors and filmmakers out there, give them a little tip, a heads up. Because I've worked with directors who were like, you know what, you got they come from an editing background, which is invaluable. Can save you incredible amount of time are you in your head going i know what i need i know how to get into this shot and i know how to get out of this shot or you're like you know like let me paint about four or five different versions if i have time what's what's your style is that for me or for rick Heffitt? or for ned sorry man because you oh. know you're editing you're consulting rick i was saying it was great to have an editor on the editor actually on set which you never get to have so I would, uh, my question also was Sean's question, I think is asking like, were you kind of cutting it as we were going or? Yeah, I mean, we, we, you know, we, we took the time, which, which anybody should do to, to really try to sketch out exactly what we thought, what we, how we thought it would come together uh, on, on paper and like, you know, shot listed, we made a storyboard. We, we did a lot of talking and discussions, sometimes very spirited discussions about uh, Alex is smiling there. I, Alex I, and I got into it one day. I arrived to a meeting, production meeting late one time to find them like shouting at each other. So it was pretty hilarious for me, but, um, but yeah, but we, we, we did our best to plan everything. And then, of course, and then we improvised when we had to because uh, things don't always go the way you think they will or hope they will. You don't always have the equipment you need. Um, uh, especially on a small production like this, things can, you know, because when you're when you're working with vendors or with crew, 
when you don't have a lot of money and a lot of time, you don't be, you, you, it's harder to be the priority. People are going to say, well, mm, sorry, we can't help you now. It's something else has come up and you have to adapt and you have to expect that things are going to not go exactly uh, your way. So, but thankfully everybody on set was, you know, was, um, was game. Uh, and I think it's, I think it's part of shooting at night is everybody's like, well, we're already here. We got sandwiches, we got coffee. Let's, let's just make this happen. There was a lot of good food. I just have to shout out my mom because she cooked for like three days and like it was a lot of, it was all homemade food. We didn't order anything, I don't think <laughs> at all. And she made everything and was there all mm -hmm. night. And shout out to mommy. Yeah, don't forget to everybody else, but mommy to me. And yep, don't forget your AC. And my aunt, my aunt, and, and my aunt Leora. There was lots of people helping. Yes, of course. Made some delicious, yeah, delicious food, delicious. <laughs> well, if you're not paying anybody, you have to make them eat good food. You have to give them good food. You're like, I'm not but, paying you really any money, so. <laughs> and yeah, and it's, to answer your question, Sean, yeah, I mean, you, you, no matter how much planning you do, you always have to try to keep that the edit. If you have, hopefully you, everybody has a picture of the movie in their head and you try to shoot for that. And then as much as you can spend the, t spend, you have to learn how to spend the, the limited time you have getting the pieces that are going to make something. And hopefully you get the pieces that'll make the thing that you want, but at least you're going to have pieces that fit together in some way. Cause all too often you wind up finishing your shoot and they're like, Oh God, we never got the other side of this conversation or whatever. Cause you were moving oh, too fast. Sure. Were there any moments, and I'll speak to you first or anybody can pop in on this, where, because it's certainly independent filmmaking, like, okay, we're not going to get that shot. Either the sun's coming up or there's too much light coming from here, but the neighbor's doing his lawn at two in the morning or whatever, right? Were there any, like, kind of cool, happy accidents? Because you do have to get improvisational sometimes. You know, what you imagine and the way you planned it, like you were talking about, Ned, like, it doesn't always go as planned. In fact, quite honestly, it doesn't sometimes and then people get into these heated as you call them spirited conversations you're like wait let's make this productive did you have any of those crossroads you were like holy mother of god how are we going to do this and then you found some spontaneity in the moment and created something even better than you imagine i well i can think of like two things uh, one is that we expected a piece of a camera of a, um, and Alex can talk about this. We had a steady cam, sort of a steady cam shot using um, a stabilizer rig that the vendor screwed us and didn't give us the, all the pieces to the rig. So Alex had to literally hold this really heavy thing up and try his best to keep the camera sort of steady. We had this whole idea for a, uh, kind of like a cool runner, you know, taking us around and showing us people and stuff. And it didn't quite work the way we hoped. Uh, but I think but, it still looks pretty good. Well, that's because, yeah, because that's because I think you had the idea, Rekevit, to like, well, let's just make it a, like, let's play with time a bit. Let's make it something different than what we thought using what we had. So that, you know, and I feel like I get a lot more directing in the editing room with Ned than I did <laughs> necessarily on set because it was like, what do we do with this? Like, how do we make this? Um, yeah, it's like the movies are made right there in the editing room. I mean, if you yeah. think about it, right? I mean, and, yeah. And the one other thing I recall is I think it was Rakefit coming out of the car. You sort of like when oh, you when fell I down. Oh, yeah. Yeah, when I was climbing out of the car after Michael viciously attacks me and we giggled for the entire time we were in the car, I came out of the car and I wanted it to look real and we had to take the pad away that I was falling on and I was like, I I'm just gonna fall. <laughs> so I just like threw myself out of the car and was like, whatever, it's fine. I had some bruises. <laughs> That's all right. Those are battle wounds. We call those battle wounds. Yeah. Now, remember, keeps mentioning Alex. So is Alex here? He's with us, Alex right? is the DP yep. over there in the... Let's get you on, Alex. I want to talk to you a little bit, introduce yourself, and uh, I want to hear about the most challenging sequence. All yeah. right. Um, well, hey, I'm Alex U. Griffin, and I was the cinematographer on Boo, and it was a wonderful experience in general. You know, lots of heated discussions, you know, throughout the set, just always yelling and, and screaming. And there was not a lot 
lot of yelling and screaming. That's not even true. There was a lot of crying. There was a lot of crying. (laughs) (laughs) There was, there was. No, 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 no. It it was fantastic. Um, And I've worked with Ned a number of times and I'm very happy that, yeah, um, that I was able to get hooked up with everybody on this this film. Um, It was a wonderful experience working literally with everybody. And um, in terms of the most challenging sequence, I'm trying to, to think what it actually would have been. Um, honestly, I would say wider shots, just from <laughs> like a, a, a limitation standpoint, just because we did not have a lot of, or any budget, really and so i think we rented one light i, I think we wanted like one 4k our gaffer cricket had... kept saying like i need a crane and i was like i that's i can't get you a crane i don't know what you want me to do. yeah she, one 4k You're yeah one nice one 4k yeah we we had like i i have my own like smaller kit and and uh so we had other lights that were there, Kino Flows and China Balls and, and um, a few smaller lights. But in terms of like lighting a parking lot, that's what we had. And um, and that was definitely kind of the, well, we hope this works. <laughs> this Alex, is everything for the folks going back there. home, can you tell us what, a, what one 4K gets you? Oh, man. So if you're shooting like in an environment that I'm in, one 4K is more than enough light you need. But to... To light an entire parking lot, it's it's almost the equivalent of just like a street lamp in the parking lot. Um, maybe a little bit stronger, but not quite. But you did such a good job. Look at how we're lit behind Michael. We look so good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but that but that was probably the the biggest challenge. Was just trying to, but even for all the such, just trying to make stuff work with what we had and you know and a lot of that also goes to cricket you know for even though she couldn't get her crane (laughs) that she asked for every 10 minutes um you know she did a great job of setting up the lights and and being able to optimize what we had And, and also with a crew you know a lot of people we had were volunteers people were doing a lot of things and even my crew a lot of them didn't really have experience so while I was working with Ned and Rakefit, Cricket would often be almost like half teaching, half gaffing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with the other Honestly, there. she did a really great job. She's been doing it a long time on much bigger budget things. So shout yep. out to Cricket. <laughs> so here's a question. You mentioned you work with Ned a lot. And I think it's when you have a camera operator, director, editor kind of working all together, there's a shorthand that you have. And of course, this is a horror film. Did you, in your mind, both of you have a specific style you and a, a lighting vibe you were trying to create? Like that, you know, that Sixth Sense, not the movie, literally. I'm talking about like another voice in the film. Did you have that in your I mind? I wanted it to look like Twilight. That's what I told him. I was like, I want it to look like Twilight. <laughs> I, you know, I recall talking about, we really, we wanted big, deep shadows. We wanted really beautiful, rich colors like you know Rakefit has this she had this uh very specific hoodie that you can see behind her in her background which was very kind of this deep burgundy um and they're like and the two guys are both wearing blue I think so there's a very very specific I get the yeah, same shirt, shirt on I didn't even notice you just look like that to me now all the time in my head <laughs> but I'm sure I, well that was kind of like Rakefit sort of thought at the beginning was like I want to try to you know, really differentiate these people with color and then everything else is sort of kind of a neutral and the characters have the color and it's this very much kind of this guys are sort of in blue and then Rakefit. I wanted the red and blue because it's blood. Blood is red and blue, right? It's blue and it doesn't hit oxygen. It's red when it does. So I liked those. I like those colors. I just kept telling Ned very things like that. Like I wanted to look like Twilight. I want reds and blues. And then he would like, be like, okay, this is what we need <laughs> for that to happen. I, I think what Alex was able to do, and it speaks to both what Rakefit was after, but also it was sort of a play, t- thing where, where the limitations actually helped us was the fact that we could only light a certain distance 
a, a certain radius. You can only light so much when it's otherwise dark. And that actually helped us because if you looked around that parking lot, you'd see all sorts of stuff. You'd see trucks and people and, you know, other cars parked. And, and Rekhavit wanted this very, to feel a very, like a lonely parking lot. So actually the fact that we could only light a certain radius of, of the space anyway, actually really helped that because everything else was just fell off into these shadows that you couldn't see, you couldn't penetrate. Yeah, the unknown. That's what's scary, more scary than most people, just the unknown. Michael, yeah. talk about scary. Let's get into you, man. How you How's doing? Good. I'm good. I'm good. good. Tell is, uh, about your experience in the film. Uh, first, I'd just like to say I'm, I'm enjoying this so much because I was gone out of the country for seven months and I didn't really have internet. And so this is the first time I'm ever using Zoom. Yeah. So I'm like going around and meeting. different <laughs> views. So while you guys have been talking, I've been trying to learn Zoom, so. Welcome to hell. Welcome. Yeah, exactly. Welcome to the world, right? Welcome to the world. Go back to where you came from. Get off Zoom, man. Go Get off Zoom. Spain. It's way nicer there. Um, the, my, my experience with the film was great. Um, I love, uh, I love the the indie horror world. Like I, I didn't really know much about it. And then I was in a movie a few years ago uh, called Carnage Park. And just, I guess that like opened my eyes up to that world and just, I didn't know it was so big. Um, and so, and I love indie filmmaking. I love watching people put things together. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a great experience. It was a great experience. I really enjoyed it. You enjoy being evil he was good. very mean in that in the mean. in that scene <laughs> sure go. you were mean. scary he yeah. gave a great performance what do you, we, don't want, we don't want to give any spoilers away right well i, I mean say, josh was the boyfriend i tried to be the boyfriend <laughs> I failed. Uh, I well was... I, I don't know how to deal with the spoiler thing now because everybody spoiled it in all of the comments so obviously if you haven't seen the movie do not read the comments um but yeah I think it's going to be out now. It's just that's just how it is. Love it. Now I have uh, I got a personal question a little bit for everybody in a way that um, the people in the interviews that I do, the people that I talk to, the thing that sort of fascinates me as an artist is the art of living as a creative person. Never easy. Not it's maddening to many people, and a lot of the kids and the people that I talk to, are like, well, how do you how do you do an act? How do you become an actor? How do you and I think there is an art to living as a creative person. And a lot of times uh, people don't understand the struggle Like, well, I can struggle, I can take rejection, um, but I'm not sure they're literally cut out for that. I'm gonna start with you, Rekhavi, because we've had a go around in a lot of these independent films and uh, creative people and people have to pay the bills or whatever. And there is an art, finding your passion, finding your purpose and continuing to expand your potential. Right, like you want to keep yeah, growing. I think you just have to like not like be convinced there's nothing else you can do. Do you know what I mean? Like I want to give up all the time because I don't make any money and I don't have this big career that I'm super famous or that people are getting me in rooms or whatever. Um, but other than my day job, which is teaching kids <laughs> um, on Zoom now, which is not fun, um, I there's nothing I really want to do other than this. So I feel like I don't have a, a, a choice. I feel like you it's it, it chooses you. Like you have to. I tell kids that I coach acting, coaching. I tell them all the time, like if you don't want it more than you want anything else in the world, don't do it. <laughs> like just don't. Like don't because. There's just, it's constant rejection and lots of, it's very hard on your ego and it's very just hard on you as a person and I'm, you're struggling all the time. It's hard to pay bills. Okay, you know, so with all that being said, which is- I all, just made it really negative. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the realities. Let's just be honest. I mean, unless- It's true you know, though. 5% or less than 5% of people who are like bankrolling, this is the, these are the experiences you go through. So when you go through those, the rejection, all the heartache, the late nights, and you know, we, were, we had a few conversations here about the heated discussions and the spirited creative people are trying to come together for one creative goal. So when you're down and when you keep getting pummeled, what do you do? What do you either say to yourself 
But what, what do you do to go, this is where I belong. This is my passion. This is my purpose. Um, unfortunately, I think it's actually outside um, validation. I, I wish I could say that it comes from in me, but it's if somebody tells me they liked what I did or if they tell me it moved them or if they tell me it meant something to them or if they tell me um, or whatever, or they, or, or, or after all that rejection of somebody's like, good job, and here's like an award, and here's a nice word, and here's like whatever. I, I don't want to say that those are the things that are important, but those are the things I hang on to in the times that I don't feel like I can keep doing it. Because I think, I, I try to think like I met this guy after a screening once and he was an addict and he showed me his real sobriety uh, chip. And he was like, I just want to say that I haven't seen a movie, like a horror movie, that has shown addiction in like a real way. And I felt really connected to it. And I felt like it was describing me the way that I felt when I, when I was addicted to something. And he was like almost crying. He was like, it really moved him. Like he really felt like he had been seen. And that to me is worth like 10,000 rejections or, or, or 10,000 comments telling me they didn't like the movie or whatever. Um, and I gave him a free boo chip because I was like, now you have two sobriety chips because that's awesome. And I don't know, like that stuff is what keeps me going, I guess. It's because I don't think as artists, we're, well, some people are doing it for themselves, maybe. But for me, art is about for other people. It's something I can give to, it's my gift that I can give to other people, whether it's writing or acting or whatever. And if somebody receives it well, then that's, it's like, which it's is great. It feels just, worth it. Well, <laughs> it feels worth it. it. But if you're not having an impact on someone's life, what are you doing? I don't want to do some mental masturbation about this great script in my head and then yeah. call it. I mean, I could write a bunch yeah. of great scripts and no one else will see it. And I guess I could feel good about that. But like, but why would I, if they were good, why would I want to keep it from somebody else getting something out of it? Cool. Before I move on, I want to tap into one more thing because, you know, you talk about validation on an external source which is can be precarious because yeah. you, you know you were, you well, were talking about earlier sure. about reading all the negative comments and of course some of them sting some of them are helpful sure, sure. some of them are not right and you've got a bunch of awards for this family film bunch of them which is fantastic and you know the level that sustains you um i'd be interested to know how that compares to is there one specific thing that somebody has said that's been hurtful about your film or about your work or maybe personal that you've reflected on. I'm like, you know what though? This is gonna help me. Oh, I can't, I don't know if I could think of one in particular, but I've definitely gotten criticism, constructive criticism that I felt was good, good criticism to, to take in and learn from. Um, sure. I'm still learning about myself as a person. I'm learning that I'm I'm very the reason I produce and write and direct is I'm I'm a control freak. I want to be in control of everything, <laughs> and when I'm not in control, it makes me crazy. So I know that that's why I'm like that. But it's something that I need to let go of. And I've been told by executives that I've met like that want to make possibly make movies with me. They're like, you have to pick something. You can't. I mean, I know you want to direct it and star in it and write it and whatever, but like you kind of have to um, focus your energy on on one or two things and really put it there. And I think that there's something to that because you can spread yourself so thin that you do everything kind of okay instead of one thing really great because you're trying to do all of the things. Well and honestly, I just want to act. <laughs> That's all I've ever wanted to do. And now yeah. everybody wants me to direct. And I'm like, I just want to be in, I just want to act. Well, so, there you go. Well, you're doing it all, right? You set your priorities. You're I have to pick one, one apparently. Yes. Yeah. And you, wanted, you wrote it. You made it happen. And more than anything, you should celebrate that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you're, you've turned in, you've turned a vision into a reality, regardless of whether there's negative comments or a million awards, you accomplished the task that you set your heart out to and you put your heart and your energy, your focus into it, and you did it. Oh, they're, both of my films were the hardest things I've ever done in my life, college included. I'm not a parent, so I couldn't say if that would, I'm sure that would be a lot harder. Um, but 
I'm, they're the things I'm the most proud of. The things that were hardest for me are the things that I'm most proud of. But I would love to hear what like Josh and Michael, I, I would just love to hear because everybody, all of us are in different kind of points in our career. And I would love to hear somebody that maybe feels not as negatively about it. As I do. Yeah, that's where I want to go. I do own, I'm going to get to that, man. Let me ask you as an editor, and you wear a bunch of hats and I'm sure you get opportunities that you would just have to go, no, this doesn't serve my soul. That doesn't serve my passion or I'll do this for a paycheck. You may not like it, but you know, finding that balance, um, how do you live as an artist? Um, <clears throat> well, it's interesting because you know, when, when you're working in, in, uh, in, post-production when you're working as an editor you know you're not the drive you're not usually the driving force behind a project unless it's your thing and you know for me I'm I I uh when I first I was very lucky when I first moved to Los Angeles to land a, a prod land a uh a, a job cutting a feature and it didn't pay really much and you know the movie's not the not the strongest piece of work but I felt in that moment like wow exactly what I, the job, the exact job I wanted to come to Los Angeles after a long time in New York, the, 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 right out of the gate, here I am in the Hollywood, literally at Sunset Gower, cutting a film with movie stars that I recognize in it. Um, and despite, and for me, I, you know, and ultimately, you know, I, I kept working with, the, with, with, the, with that team and, and ultimately I, we parted ways because I didn't feel like it was giving me, it was the direction I wanted to go. But that first, especially that first time, I just felt, wow, here I am. I'm doing exactly what I set out to do. And no one can take that away from me. And yeah, they great. And, and I think there are bigger and better projects out there, but like I've actually done it and I feel like a professional. And I think that a lot of times when you, when you find yourself doing what it is, and especially when you get paid for it, um, doing what it is you think you, you know that you're good at and you have a passion for, and, even when the circumstances aren't perfect, that's what sort of keeps you going. It's like, you know what, everything, all, I could be so much unluckier. I could be doing so many other things or think so many things could might not have worked out. And how lucky am I to be here ex doing, living sort of a version of that cliche, you know, making movies in Hollywood. And there was a part of me, like even when I was working in New York and living in New York, I. I was there for nine years and I always, I ne it never failed that I would look up kind of around myself and be like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm living and working in New York City. This is awesome. And, and I felt very, very lucky and I could reflect, I can reflect on all the things that sort of led me there and gave me that opportunity. And, uh, you know, I could, I, I, and because I am I'm in my, I'm not wealthy or I'm not like cutting huge movies, but, but, but uh, on the other hand, here I am sitting with all you people and doing making movies and having a good time. That's pretty lucky. You're so really I, good at that, it. That's why. You <laughs> nailed it. That is one of the things that I think people forget all the time. You, you know, you were saying, how lucky am I? And I do this like daily, just checking with myself, especially when it's, you know, there's a challenging day, shit's not going my way or whatever. I'm like, how lucky, how blessed, whatever your word is. Mm -hmm. And you stop in that moment. You've said that already like three times in that, that, that sound bite right there. And I was like, that's exactly it. You're not thinking about, oh my God, why aren't I working with Spielberg? Why aren't I? And you're, you're on a production with the people that are all right here, creating this piece of art, this, this, this movie. And you, you took the time to appreciate that for what it is. I think that's the part where people get off the rails and they're never appreciating what they have. And it's great if people are always like trying to expand or trying to grow and, and am, I a direct, am I a better director, am I a better editor, am I a better cinematographer? What's my gift? You know, checking in with those who said something about, you know, what is your talent? What, is your, what are you good at? But I think you nailed it, Ned, just taking the time to go, yeah, man, I'm making a movie. I do it all the time, whether it's <laughs> money or, you know, a decent budget. Mm -hmm. Like, hold on. And I'd have a little ritual before I begin uh, a movie and a little ritual on my last day. But um, I think that's such sound, solid advice, dude, um, for people who are in the creative business is just to take time out to go, God, how lucky am I to do 
what I love to do. Not, yeah. oh my God, I got a bunch of bills to pay. I'm not saying we don't have those realities, but to acknowledge, damn, man, you're in New York City doing that. Now you're in LA doing it. People are in the world <laughs> trying to get to these places. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. Oh, yeah. What a blessing to recognize like, that. And and I think that's, for me, I it, it becomes kind of like a baseline to, to or a jumping off point for like making, like, all right, I've made it this far and now I can, I have a, a solid foundation to hopefully get better at what I do, to get better opportunities, to make my own, make some of my own luck going forward. And, um, but it's nice to know that I can always sort of have that to, to, to look back at. Cause that's all you got, man. I, mm -hmm. I agree. like, you know, when you look back at your life and you either, you know, create a vision of the future or you live in the memories of the past and you're like already the wheelhouse is going about what can happen in the future because you're appreciating what you have, not beating yourself up about, you know, I tapped into it with the a little bit about any of the criticisms. Mm -hmm. You take what propels you forward, what brings you success, what brings you joy and happiness, and you run with it. Criticism, criticism propels me very well. I love it. Every time I get broken up with, I write a movie. And <laughs> you know what? I happen to kill all of them. That's just, that's just what happens, you know? You, know, you break Swift, up with man. me, you're, you're gonna die Swift. in my next movie, I promise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Buyer, beware to the, to the person who dates you. <laughs> it's okay. That's why nobody's dating me. Um, uh, because they're not alive. Let's be honest. I'm kidding. No, they've ghosted. They're, they're bad people. I, I think. Um, I, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say to Kevin regarding like criticism, and I've I've seen sometimes like I've looked on the Amazon comments or whatever about movies I've edited or something, and then some, and occasion most people ignore the editing most of the time. Sometimes they're like, oh, this is a bad, this is bad editing. And this didn't make any sense. And some, and I, I have to sort of like, just sort of lean back and be like, do you have any idea how much of a pain in the ass to, it was to get, get it this good? Like, yeah, it's not Citizen Kane, but you, uh, you should have seen what we started with. You should have seen the performance that the actor did not deliver. Well, most the, people are not they don't know we what they're doing get. anyway. They're just saying that they just they have nothing to do. But oh, I sure, love yeah. it. bring on the criticism. That's, that's fine. I love it. I love I it. I think that's but that's <laughs> that's what kind of helps me with criticism. It's like yeah, I get it, man. I get it that this is the greatest thing you've ever seen. But seriously, look, watch the dailies and then tell me if you can do it any better. That's an so, art, man. Uh, that, that that's that's an art because this doesn't include yeah. Boo. I'm I'm just gonna say that. No, no, no. <laughs> But you don't have to. It does to. include Jax, though. <laughs> uh, no, no, uh, <laughs> Jax was fixed in the editing room very much. But um, anyway, Josh, Michael, I wanted, I want you guys to talk. I want, I don't oh, want yeah. to waste your time. You just... Let me get Alex. Who now? Alex or Michael? Josh, you available? Uh, sure. Um, uh, to, I think. How, how are you doing as a creative, man? I think. Uh, what Ned said is 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 spot on, but uh, in in other ways, yeah, celebrating little victories. I think it's important. I try um, when whenever any of my friends have any, like even if it's even if it's a really small part, you know, we have. I try I try to celebrate it and be like, hey, you're on TV. You're doing what you wanted to do, like your entire life. I always try and think of what little kid Josh would say if I was like, oh, my part isn't big enough. Like little kid Josh would kick me in the nuts. <laughs> uh, and nice. and so celebrating little victories and you know when you don't have an agent or a manager celebrating like a good day in class like doing a good scene like appreciating that like ned said you're doing what you said you wanted to do and then now this is setting you up to get to get that good audition or, or whatever and then celebrate the victories and work towards the future and also <coughs> excuse me um I think it's important to have uh, some some good friends that uh, inspire you and keep you motivated, and uh, you can kind of commiserate with, but also celebrate together, and uh, and not be competitive. Well, I mean, friendly com competition is fine, but not, not you know. Agreed. You know. Yeah, yeah. I think people's egos get in the way sometimes. Certainly with yeah. and artists, and oh my God, I auditioned for the, that role. How come I didn't get it? Or the comparison game 
never works, man. You like, and I think you're spot on there, Josh, with a community of people who support you. And if yeah. they don't, like, I, I mean, I often say, look, either someone in my life either elevates my energy or they drain it. If they drain it, I'm out. Yeah, don't, don't don't hang well, out. Don't hang out with those people. Right? Energy to... vampires are. There you go. <laughs> well said, Josh. What do you do when, um, uh, when times get tough as an artist? And yeah, bills, da 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 da, and you didn't get this role, and you know how we get close. And um, um, writing, writing, I I'd, I'd I'd like to do more writing, but writing always makes me feel like a superhero because I'm like, ha, I don't need anybody. I can do it all myself. Uh, yes. And it and it kind of gets me past the uh, the funk oftentimes. Uh, but also hanging out with friends and or making something doing something creative and, and building something, uh, I think helps make me feel like I'm empowered. I love that super, super, uh, super human power you've got. Because that, I, I find myself the same thing. Like if I can create something or even accomplish a little task, whether it's fixing you know, a little water heater and I'm not even like a you know geek kind of person, but if I can create something from nothing and I think with the writing is kind of one of those things too. I agree, you're like, it's my own head. I wrote it, I don't care if I, someone sees it or not, but you're creating something out of nothing. Um, yeah. Seems to be pretty sustainable to you. Do you, are do, these creative do, projects outside of acting in the creative world? Like, I, I like to, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to get better at it, but I, I do 3D, 3D modeling and printing. So I, I make things and then 3D print them. And it's like, wow, that was in my head. And now it's a piece of plastic that I can <laughs> hold. It's oh, kinda, tangible stuff, like hands yeah. on. From the, oh, yeah. Right on. That's great. Do you find yourself kind of gravitating to that sometimes? Like my brother's a completely hands-on gearhead. He needs to just touch it very tactile. He's like, I don't know what you do with the creative shit, Sean. I, I, that's not my thing. That's my brother. But um, he finds joy in that. Do you just, is that your way of balancing? Um, yeah. Yeah. I think it, I think it makes, it also makes me feel like I'm, I'm not just, even though I'm not going to have a career out of, you know, 3D printing or modeling or anything, but, uh, but it makes me feel like I'm not just beholden to acting, you know, like I, 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 I can, I do other things. Which is a balance, which is a balanced life. People ask, ask me, how do you be an actor? I'm like, live your life, man. Yeah. Or live, you're engaged in the life that you've been blessed with. You know, a lot of times as actors, we get lost and it's sort of the beauty, blessing and curse, I guess, is you can lose yourself in all these great characters. A lot of times uh, you don't even know yourself. You're like, mm -hmm. you're talking about, oh shit, man, I like 3D modeling or, you know, you do these things. You're not waiting for the phone. What's one big piece of advice, Josh, you'd give anybody who's like, look, man, I want to be an actor. My family thinks it's the most insane thing in the world to do. What should I do? Uh, I always, my secret when I when I first came out to LA and had no credits and no nothing was, I always knew that I was going to make it. So I, I, it was kind of like a secret little thing. Like when pe I loved it when I have a painting of uh, Dream So Big uh, that people laugh in your face. It made me so happy to know, like it was like I knew like some something about quantum physics that no one else knew and I was like ah, they don't even they think that I'm not going to make it and they're dumb for that and 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 then I just kind of held on to that and they well, I mean when I booked my first like tv gig <laughs> they were they were they were they were like well I it's you shouldn't that shouldn't work I don't understand I was like I know I love that. I love that. Yeah, that's, that's so a, good. That yeah. golden nugget, man. You hang on to it. And everyone has their own little thing that they go, look, this is what I'm going to do when you know I get down or get down in the dumps or the world is sort of crap feels like it anyway, crashing in on you. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's your own thing, too. I love how that sort of comes from within you. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big proponent of that because, you know, we start looking around the outside world for validation. Not to discredit what you're saying. I'm, I admitted that that is not the way you should go. I, I don't think that that's the way you should do it. I was just being honest. That that's no, you how I feel. But actually, Josh, I like that you um, like kind of 
say to that because I've always kind of felt the same way about myself, but I don't even want to admit it to myself, I think. <laughs> like I've always felt like there's no way I can't make it because I literally have devoted my entire being and life and every single thing ever since I was six years old to making it in this business. And that doesn't mean I have to be famous or whatever, but that I'm working and doing what I, what I love to do and getting paid for it and not having to do anything else. I have no doubt that even if it takes me until I'm 60 or 70 years old, I will get there. But it's, I'm glad you said that because it's something that I should make more conscious to myself. So like, I, I know I believe it inside, but sometimes I don't want to admit that I believe it or I let the outside stuff convince me that that's not true. But I think that the people, so are, like, people who are successful are persistent in this business. That's it, period. I don't, yeah. I don't even think there's talent and opportunity and luck. Yes. But if you're not persistent, then you probably won't make it. It's very hard. You have to climb to the top of the pile every single time, you know, and yeah. it, you have to believe in yourself in order to do that. Yeah, if you're not your biggest champion, um, who is? Yeah, I don't care if people think I'm full of myself and they're like, shut up about your movie because guess what? I'm going to get a million freaking views. I don't care. I'm going to keep posting about it and I'm going to hound everybody and I'm going to text people and that's how we got the money in the first place. So you know, like if I have to, I will, yeah. you know? You're a success. You are a huge success. You know, you're talking about, well, I'm going to get there when I'm 60. I'm like, wait a minute, you're, you're there. I'm there you're maybe in the, in, in the indie world, which is a great world to be in. Honestly, I don't know that I want to leave the indie world because it's a much kinder place <laughs> than, than the studio world. I've been in the studio world and it, it not the same feeling, but it is yeah. nice to get paid. <laughs> different <laughs> lessons, nice. different places for sure. Is Alex there? Yeah. Yeah, I'm right, John, I hear you, man. So, uh, living yeah, is a ahead. creative artist, man. What's what's your key to to happiness? Yeah. Um, so I think there's like for me personally, there's a couple factors, and um, one is I grew up in poverty. Uh, I. I my mother is disabled. She can't work uh, uh, like a steady job um, and had three kids. And, and because of that, she was always very thrifty, very uh, uh, she found ways to make things happen, even if it was like the thing, the cards are stacked against her. Um, and, and as a kid, it kind of sucked. But as an adult, I find it very helpful in that I can also use that kind of thriftiness, not, not only like uh, in my personal life, but even like on sets, trying to figure things out or make something work. Um, Cause I can try to think about an alternate route that somebody else might not have thought of just because that's been kind of ingrained in me. Um, but also just my, I guess where the bar is of comfort. Um, and like, I have a number of friends where, you know, they've been very depressed and sad and talking about, oh, how, horrible they can't make enough money and they can't live and everything else and i'll be like hey you're making like twice what i'm making right now shut up right. <laughs> um but, but it is kind of that you know but that it's that idea of you know i guess being comfortable with where you're at when you're there and you know and i don't i hope i'm not <laughs> i don't like become very poor and, and and stay there stay that way but um it's definitely helped as you're you're continuing to grow and move and um and then also like like i was going to kind of relate it to something that ned said about working on a project so when i first came to la um i had a similar experience with that which and i think it was like within a, a year and a half of coming to la and this was it was a low budget but i got to work uh as a cinematographer on a feature film um, an all puppet feature film with a bunch of celebrity voices, Whoopi Goldberg, Nathan Fillion, George Takei, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and it was really exciting and wonderful because it gave me that first glimpse of like, oh yeah, I'm here, I'm doing this. And I just got here, wow, you know, this is great. And, but also because it was an ultra low budget set and also, and a lot of kudos just to the director, uh, Sam Koji Hale, for being, he's just a very calm person, but also somebody that likes to, I guess, nurture talent. And and, uh, and Heather Henson, Jim Henson's 
uh, youngest daughter was the executive producer and she's also somebody who likes to nurture talent. And so the set itself was very, I don't know, it, it was a group of people making a film together. And, and it was, you know, just a very open set um, for the most part for just people to do what they love doing and get it done. And honestly, it kind of like wired my brain in a way that I think right afterwards, I did a, a couple Walmart, Walmart commercials and, and, and I was kind of like given a crew and, and a bunch of stuff. And I was, I had forgotten how toxic and backstabby, <laughs> like working on a bigger production can sometimes be. And, and that's when I said in my head, I'm like, okay, you know, I might take a job for the money, but I have the means and the ability to be comfortable at different economic levels. And so I'd much rather work with people on something positive and, and work with people that are, are willing to be open and inclusive and progress, I guess, yeah, make something together in that kind of progressive mindset rather than like a, a complete dictatorship. Um, and, and, and unless it's Do you needed, wake up like, with that mindset or, or does that take work for you? Do you know what I mean? What, what, what was the question again? Lost. Oh no, what? he froze. No, he said, "Do you oh, wake no. up with that mindset?" And I, 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 oh. I want answer, and then I want to hear Michael's take, and then we should wrap up because. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so do I wake up with that mindset? Uh, I'd say yes, um, and I think it's just because I have been around a, a lot of creatives, and it's. But for me, it, it's I guess the idea of comfort, but also promoting something that at least for me, I think is a benefit. And even if, even if like for Boo, and I would say the set, our set was a very like Ned and, and Rick Heffitt and myself. And like, I felt like, you know, that was a set where we all worked together, like from, you know, from the beginning, from pre-production on. And, um, and that's something I really like. And even if Boo was purely a horror film and like, doesn't help the greater public, although obviously, as we know, it has. People have been affected by it, and people have been seen, you know, through it. Um, it's, you know, it's still something I'd, I'd rather put my time and energy into, and, and I'm much more willing to be okay with taking a bit of a sacrifice for that. Yeah. Um, and okay. and yeah. Yeah. And, and that I... for me, success. And that for me also helps. If the money thing isn't there, then it's it's not as bad. Um, but I had a mentor once that told me, and this is the thing I also, every morning I wake up with is, don't forget the spark that brought you here to begin with. The spark that brought me here is I was born here. <laughs> but yes, I like yeah. that. Uh, Michael, quickly, uh, tell me, I wanna hear your answer to this question about the artistry, even though we lost Sean, cause I think his camera, it, something happened, but That's it's fine. Good. I want to hear your answer and then we'll wrap it up because I've taken too much of your time as it is, but I'm loving this. I could do this all day, which we won't, but I'm just saying it's awesome. Um, I think it's, uh, the, the um, hmm, you would think I'd have time to think about this. I guess, um, what am I thinking about? It's just, it's just better, um, take with what you got right now, like uh, with this whole COVID thing. And I think you just do with what you, what you're dealt. And like right now, I think um, for instance, I have a lot of family that's in Spain and I never go to see them because as an actor, you're always like waiting for the next job. You're always waiting for the next audition. And now that this has happened with Zoom, I was auditioning from Spain. You can audition from wherever you want now. And it's awesome. You're not expected to go. So I don't know. And I also think like when you get down on things, because like the, the, the first question was like, you know, what would you recommend to other people who want to get into this business? I mean, it's a, it's cliche for a reason why people are always like, don't get into it because it's, it's a hard life because it is difficult uh, with, with what a lot of people like, but like what uh, Josh was saying, I've always had that feeling too. Like, oh, you just don't know. And I, I feel like I can get into a room with anybody and, and, and play like that because I just love it so much. And if you're good at playing, we'll have a really good time at it. You know what I mean? And that's just, that's just how I see it. I also see it as 
if I'm focusing, like if things are getting down, I just try to focus on other people, like maybe see where I can help somebody else out with something because everybody goes through ups and downs. Um, and I also feel like, you know, like it kind of relates to with what I was talking about where you can zoom anywhere, like life in LA, um, if you allow it to be, it can be all like uh, restricted and, you know, you're getting um, denied for roles and this, that, and the other thing. But you just, if you live your life, I feel like that doesn't come down on you so much. And now that we can go out and live our lives and help other people and focus on those other things, that's when, for me as an actor, that's when I grow. Because like, just like from this meeting, what I'm gonna learn about it the most is thinking about Alex and the story he told about with his mom being disabled. And like, that just gets my mind going. And oh, be, and I can now think of like all positions of the three kids, like how they each, and even though it's not gonna have anything to do with really Alex's life, unless I have a conversation with them, it just gets my mind going on that kind of stuff. And I don't know, that's what I enjoy. He's a caller. Cool. And, well, yes. And real quick, if I can just jump in, Michael says, uh, play. That's all I want to say. You, you mentioned the word play, and I think that can be so important on all levels. Yeah, the you second know. you stop playing, it, it's not worth it anymore because it's just, it's just not. And I think that's the only thing that I like about writing more than acting is that I don't need permission from someone else to play. <laughs> if I want to play with my writing, I can play with my writing. I don't need to audition for it or get the part or <laughs> be on set or how many days or whatever. Cause I, for me, it's not about making money or being famous. It really isn't. Those are nice things. Not the famous part. I really actually don't want to be famous. It sounds terrible, but uh, the money thing sounds good. Um, but like, I just want to be able to get up and be like, I'm doing what I love every day. And so, that, cause it doesn't feel like work. Boo was hard work, but it didn't feel like work. It felt challenging and it was difficult. And there were days that I was crying and, and like having, you know, panic attacks, but it, it wasn't work. It was something like that. It was like a birth of something and it was just a lot better so anyway to wrap up I, if everyone could just if you just tell me very succinctly maybe what you're working on right now or what you want to do next um or what you're doing next or what you're doing now or whatever anything you want to like leave us with and maybe where people can find you if you want them to find you <laughs> um ned go first and then okay yeah um <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I'm right now gainfully unemployed, um, but uh, I, I had been working on a, uh, a Fox show uh, called 911 and 911 Lone Star uh, assisting, not not cutting yet, but hopefully that will start up for me uh, soon and I'll be back doing that as a day job. And then in the meantime, I'm uh, uh, working, I'm writing a new draft of a, uh, what I'm calling a feminist horror Western script. Okay, I um, want to read that. That just sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I've been holding on because I want to. I want to. I want it to be pretty good. Um, Josh already has the hand of our mustache. He's ready to go. He does. He does. <laughs> and uh, and I'm working on a. I um I'm I, I'm optioning or like just purchasing the rights to a person's short story uh, to do a short of my own, which um, nice. that's still in early, early stages. And uh, yeah, that's kind of it. And, and otherwise, uh, watching a lot of movies and killing a lot of time. <laughs> and um, yeah, but hopefully, hopefully back to work soon in the next few weeks, and hopefully have some uh, new drafts of these scripts to uh, to show around to folks. Well, thank you. And this movie, like I've said a thousand times in maybe every interview I've done, that would not be as good without you. So thank you so much for your work on it, and it means a lot to me that that you keep working with me, even though <laughs> I don't know why, but I appreciate it very much. So, um, and if you need help with any of your things, you know, I'm always there for you, whatever you need. If I can help you, I will help you. Um, all right, oh, yeah. uh, Michael, I'm just going kind of in this weird circle. Okay, Michael, tell me, talk to me. Uh, I just got back from Spain. I was there for seven months. So right now I'm just trying to organize and get everything back to normal doing a lot a lot walks around the reservoir auditioning you know when when but that's that's it just being happy right. being, making 
calls to friends and family and just catching back up with life, I guess. I love it. I was so jealous of all of your time in Spain, but <laughs> it looks so nice. Um, and we were all here like in quarantine and you're like, I'm in Spain. I'm just I'm in Spain looking around. It's great. I love it. I wish I was there. Thank you for your performance in my in my movie, in our movie, because it was great. And you're terrifying and everybody agrees that you're terrifying. <laughs> And, um, and great. I don't know. I think somebody today called you a dumpster fire of a man, your character. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> I wish I'll I was like, that's a compliment because I think literally that's what he should be. Yeah, um, I just want to thank you real quick and, and all you guys, because uh, right now probably nobody's watching this video. So this is just our time. But it was really nice to meet all of you guys. And we've had fun outside of of uh, the Zoom and just meeting outside of the set and everything. And it's, it's been good. That's one of the other reasons why we love doing this. So thank you to all of you. Thank you. All right, um, Alex, we'll go to you. All right, let me, mute, let me unmute myself. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, for me, I, I've, I've kind of always worked part-time uh, with Handmade Puppet Dreams, which is a film series done by Heather Henson, which I mentioned before is uh, uh, Jim and Jane Henson's youngest daughter. And um, and so oddly enough, my quarantine hasn't been less work. It's actually been more work because <laughs> Heather is definitely somebody that saw a need and oh my God, pup, you know, all these puppeteers and, and creatives are struggling and out of work. What can we do to inspire them? Um, and so I've actually been uh, directing and editing a, a bunch of filmmaker spotlights, looking at different uh, directors for some of our short films, hopefully to inspire people to do similar things. Um, and kind of also connected to that. Uh, so far, we we did one in spring and we just last weekend, uh, we did the 48 hour puppet film project where you make a puppet film in 48 hours. And the one this weekend was Halloween themed. Um, once again, to get people inspired or just to make a film, get out of that funk um, do something and because sometimes you need a challenge to make you get up and do it. Um, and so a lot of my stuff I've been doing is, is related to that. Um, I am working on my own film that I'm directing, The Man With No Face. It is a Western um, that looks oh, at colonialism. Nice. <laughs> yeah. No, um, that's a really light topic. Yes. Cool. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it's, and it's, uh, but I, I've been very thankful to work with a lot of great people and, and have a lot of good mentors and, and voices when writing the script um, and hopefully while filming um, from just, I guess, a variety of perspectives within the US. And um, yeah, and beyond that, I'm just making films. I've been fortunate enough to shoot a few things and, and edit a few films. And, um, and I'm also a puppeteer and I've been, Oddly enough, also fortunate to perform <laughs> in a couple of commercials when things started opening up um, late summer. And uh, if anybody wants to contact me or, or see any of my work, you can go to alexugriffin.com. Thank you, Alex. And you did an amazing job. Everyone talks about how good the movie looks like visually, which is a huge testament to you and also the fact that you, you never got flustered outside of that one meeting that we both got flustered in but on set <laughs> on set you never got flustered despite all of the craziness that was going on and i think that was my favorite meeting <laughs> um that was a tense <laughs> Yes, meaning I don't even know what was wrong or what we were even disagreeing on. I don't even think we were. I think I just we weren't getting each other. I think we were just tired and we I, weren't getting was, each other. It was yeah. a lot of tired. Um, but anyway, I, I, I just, uh, but real quick, I just want to say oh. even my, even my work, you know, is also the work of my crew and for everybody here. It's part of it is the acting and being a good actor and hitting marks and and knowing things and, and Rekepe being a good writer. I can't do anything unless it's written. And Ned for picking out the good takes and not the bad takes. So it is literally, it's it's a combination. Well, no, because we had some- No, of course, there's always, there's always bad takes. I mean, shit, that thing with me and, and Josh in the car, good Lord, there was like, the camera was stabilizing itself and doing all sorts of weird things. We were doing great. Limitations, <laughs> the camera. Limitations. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, thank you, Alex. All right, Josh, talk to me. Tell me what's happening with you. Um, I was uh, 
fortunate enough, I guess, I, I booked a pilot right before uh, Corona. And uh, so I did a table read and a wardrobe fitting on Friday the 13th of <laughs> March. And uh, lo and behold, <laughs> it was a bad Friday the 13th. Yeah, and then we just got sent home, but they've, they've we're gonna shoot in January. Oh, uh, so they're going fall. through. Good. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a really cool script. It's a I think I can say that it's it's Goonies themed, uh, and which is a, kind of a dream for me because uh, I mean nice. in my old dressing room I have the Goonies poster. Um, but yeah, so I've just been waiting, and uh, I was trying to get in really good shape during Corona, but then uh, now they told me not till January. I'm like, all right, well, don't need to worry <laughs> about it till December. Uh, and uh, just joking, JK is my Instagram and Twitter and stuff. If anyone, and it's very to, entertaining. Yeah. I I find a lot of it very entertaining. You do oh, these things, yeah. Um, Josh, thank you so much for being in my movie. I really appreciate. It. I'm so glad. I'm grateful to Parisa for for introducing us. Um, who also gave an amazing performance and Laura Slade Wiggins who both couldn't be here but they were amazing and I love them both. Um, and Parisa Fitzhenley. Parisa Fitzhenley is now on another show, Triage. I mean this girl works <laughs> so much but I mean I don't, she's like the nicest person in the world and one of the most talented actresses that I know. So um, why shouldn't she be? So I'm really excited for her. And Josh, I, I really appreciate it. Like, not only did you come and like do your job really well, but you were so helpful and you were a team player and you were observant, which I, I will never forget, never. Um, because that just would have been so bad. Um, and I didn't notice. And so, then I flew out the next morning to do a movie with Laura. Which... And yeah, and then the next morning I get a text from Laura, like I'm with Josh in like Atlanta, where were you? Somewhere. Uh, Louisville. Louisville, right, in Kentucky, yes. Um, and <laughs> anyway, so was, that's weird. And But anyway, so thank you guys for staying up all night for those shoots and, um, and for showing up and get, doing the best work and uh, obviously not really getting paid. And I, like, I hope that the experience was some form of payment and hopefully any connections that come out of it for you, hopefully maybe possibly will be helpful. Um, and, if, and if anybody needs anything from me, you just let me know, I'd be happy to help you um, if I can. <laughs> and um, anyway, so, and thank you guys for being here. So everyone should go see Boo on Alter. It's gonna be there um, permanently. And I'm trying to get that million views at least. That would be nice if everybody shared it, that would be helpful. Um, and everybody that's watching, if you shared it would be helpful and just like keep sharing it. And then we're also, I can't announce the channel yet, but we are gonna be on a VOD channel um, on Roku coming soon. Um, it's a brand new channel from a very big horror website. And we're, I think, gonna be in the premiere episode of this new show that they're doing, this new like anthology kind of a thing. Um, and we're also gonna be on this anthology DVD, hopefully um, through Vipco in the UK. And I don't know, we're just gonna get it out there to as many places as possible. But for now it's on Alter and I want everyone to go to Alter because until we hit a million views, no one else is getting it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> does, that, does that mean like you just go to alter.com? And that's so you can go to YouTube and search Alter. They have their own channel. You can also okay. go to Alter's page on Facebook. It's simultaneously being streamed on their Facebook page as well as YouTube. Their website is watchalter.com if you want to know more about them and the stuff that they do. Um, it's a really awesome com uh, company and they're run by pr the production company Gunpowder and Sky, which is kind of an up and coming horror genre uh, production company that maybe hopefully will be interested in a feature. Um, and so we'll see. But um, it's, it's great and they have a lot of subscribers and um, my friend's film got 12 million views, but I'm not, I'm not aiming that high. I'm going for a million, <laughs> um, just so that I'm happy when it happens. Um, thank you guys so much and uh, go check out their stuff and support everybody. Thank you guys for being here. I thank you. It. Thank you.